Hello, my name's Joanna Hambly and I work with Escape Trust. And we're starting our story in Brora here because behind me you can see what coastal erosion does to a building. In this place, since the 1760s, around 70 metres of coastline has been lost. The building I'm standing in now collapsed onto the beach in 2012 in a winter storm. I've lived in Barora most of my life and as a child uh, we'd go down to the back shore and uh, we, we'd, we'd see these big walls on the beach and as children what do you do? You just play on them, you know? And I was having a chat about it and I was saying, well, there's, there's, there's these uh, interesting structures on the beach. The action of the sea is eroding the walls and um, I, I was a bit concerned about it. So in 2004 we did a survey and the excavation project just uh, um, carried on from there and a lot of that work has been done with Joe Hambly of the Skate Trust as well directing quite a lot of the digs. Over the years we've carried out a number of excavations here with Klein Heritage Society and local volunteers and we found evidence of the coal-fired sea salt making process in Brora from two different periods actually, from the 17th century and also from the 18th century. Top pans were massive metal dishes, or well pans, that were heated up on Brora coal on a fire with seawater in them. They would take the seawater obviously from the sea, pour it in, pour it in and then heat it up and then wait for it to evaporate and then scoop the salt out and dry it. So although it looks um, very rural and idyllic today, if you go back 300 years or so, we'd actually be in a very industrial landscape because salt pans were only here because of coal mining. Brora coal. Well, everybody in Brora kind of says that it was a rubbish coal and it was just, it would, you'd take a match to it, it would just burn away and it wouldn't be much heat or nothing. Coal from coal mines in the hinterland behind me was brought to the pan houses on the shore and used to boil seawater in very large metal pans. In our 18th century site, we found evidence very much like brown rig described. So we found brick built furnaces, which would have supported iron pans and each furnace had a grate, and so you would lay coal onto the grate, fire the coal, which would evaporate the seawater in the iron pans. So as a, a community, we were very much involved in the excavations itself. So we, we became a bit of a community family, and not just from Brora, but from out with the area as well. We ended up with a huge amount of information. I'm looking at some of the finds here that we found over the years. Here we have some Brora salt, which they made an experiment in 2008. It's very, very mm, salty. Recently, we've set up um, the Brora Salt Pans uh, Research Group Facebook page, which um, allows us to share a lot of this information about the history, about the landscapes, about the sites on the back shore. But one thing is missing from this, and how do we reconnect with that history in real life? How do we say to people, this is how salt was made at Brora in the 18th century? We can tell them about the process, but there's nothing like the real thing. So we had a discussion with Joe from Scape, and um, it was mentioned that um, there was this group in East Lothian, uh, the Wagonway 1722 project, um, and they were making salt. So it wasn't long after that that we got in touch and we proposed the idea, you know, could you come to Brora and actually build us a salt pan here so we could actually start making salt in Brora again. I'm Gareth. And I'm Gary. And we're both from the 1722 Wagonway Group. Um, we're, we're here to build a, a salt pan. So we're on a site which is quite prominent. It's a little bit windy, maybe for what we're looking for, but still it's a good prominent site close to the Heritage Centre. Uh, I'm Nick Lindsay, I'm Chairman of Klein Heritage Society. Um, we run Brora Heritage Centre on behalf of Highland Council. 
We want to have a, a salt pan here in Brora again to recreate an industry that's long since disappeared and that is the making of salt from our own Brora seawater. This is a great thing for us to do 200 years on because nobody's seen this art of salt making in, during this time and we're able to produce this for the local community and we're hoping to attract people from the NC500 massively popular tourist route which has established itself over the last few years and we want to try and engage with some of these people that are spinning around Sutherland. Slow them down a bit and, and teach them a bit about what happened in Brora a few hundred years ago. This is us just started excavating and levelling the ground now for the salt pan. Well, obviously there's a big pan of water sitting on top and you can't afford for it to be off at all, otherwise part of it will burn and part of it will be too deep in water. We've taken the turf off the soil, not gone down too deep. We found a rocky sandy base which is nice and solid, so we're just now putting in some sand to level the thing overall. And we've got some reasonably hefty concrete slabs. We're going to bed them just on the sand so there's nothing else, they're laid dry. We've started assembling now, so we've had to cut the blocks to suit. We've just got the angle irons now for the lintels and we're assembling it basically as a trial. So we'll take it all apart again and we'll reassemble it. When we come to building the base for the pan, we're going to build that using concrete block and the concrete block will be mortared together with a hydraulic lime. Um, it's a little bit more flexible, it resists the heat a little bit better, uh, less prone to cracking than a cement mortar might be. What we're doing just now is we're putting in the steel lintels and the reason we need to do this is because we'll be setting blocks on top of these and it just stops them collapsing in. So if you look at the pan now you'll see three doorways. The door at the front is the furnace door, so that's where you light your fire from. And the two doors on the side are ash doors, so at the end of the process that's where you can take your ash out. The height of the structure that you see now, the pan will sit on top of that, so that'll be the height of the pan, that'll be your working height in the pan. Uh, there's a large concrete gather to go in the end, which is basically a, a funnel for the flue gases to come in and then the chimney will come up. Well, this is a, this is a pan that's based on the pan that we had made three years ago, um, which I based in turn on uh, proportions of pans that are described in an 18th century manual on salt making. The Broda pan that's been found so far anyway is much smaller. So generally this is very similar to what we've built, but in terms of what was here locally, this is much closer locally to the evidence that's been found here. Yeah, so I think so. I think it's actually quite close to the pans that were, were in use here. Well, of course, they were made out of uh, wrought iron plates iron. riveted together. This is all stainless steel, yeah. which is beautifully welded as well. Mm -hmm. My name's Charlie Bruce. I'm local to Bucky all my days. Um, here at the moment we're in Muckduff shipyard. I've been told it's a salt pan, you know. I've seen it on television before anyway, but it actually came from a profile shed in Macduff, and this was cut to shape in profiler by plasma. Then it was taken to the workshop and it was pressed. Then it was delivered here, I've cleaned it up, I've put it together and we're welding. We've got so many different types of stainless steel just now, and but this one is marine grade. We're marine grade or a food grade. It's a, it's expensive. It's I think it's the the best, and that's what we'll do. That'll be finished. Just welding and a bit of clean, and that'll be that'll be fine. Now. Getting the pan in was really quite easy. We we had the the forklift to Aye. lift it in. I think getting it out might be a bit of a bit of a job. Okay, Jackie, okay. Right. Okay. Right. Right. Okay. Right. 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 We've put the, the chimney on, so you'll see us next starting to build the, the stacks, the single stacks of the chimney. I think with the, the conditions here that we're on top of the hill pretty much and exposed we're feeling that we'll leave the top three blocks loose so that when the pan is ready for firing they can be brought back on 
and then taken back off again to reduce the height of the chimney just while it's sitting over the winter. Uh, we'll wrap it all up nice and tight uh, and well under the current circumstances we can't fire it up at the moment but we'll come back, we'll commission it, we'll get it alight, we'll actually start making some salt and then train some of the people here yep. on how to run it so that it can be operated here making salt in Brora. Yeah, so my name's Ed, uh, I'm the chairman of the 1722 Wagonway Heritage Group. It's a great day for salt making, some of us are making salt and some of us are doing a bit of reenactment as well. And we really want to give people a flavour of what it was like to be in the 18th century, how people dressed, how people acted, uh, what their jobs were and the type of accessories that they have. Uh, for example, we've got a wonderfully skilled Alan uh, as part of our group who makes things like this powder horn, nice little accessories to go with the rest of our outfits. Right. Uh, my name is Alan Braby. I'm uh, the archaeologist for the 1722 Wagon Way project. I also do lots of uh, reconstructions of how sites and people would have looked like at various stages in the past. Uh, we're up here to help with a bit of a social interpretation reenactment event hence the costumes of the period about 1720, 1730, just to give people an idea of how people lived in the 18th and the 17th century by dressing up in costumes, taking on the persona of the salters and the, the tax officers, etc., of the period. Gary is obviously the salt master, the salt maker in his costume. I'm basically the hired hand to stop the salt being nicked in the end. Salt was one of the most prized commodities. It was the days before fridges, so it was needed for food preservation and there was a reasonable value to it. So essentially within the salt works, yes, you had people making salt, uh, but you also need people protecting the salt from being pilfered away and smuggled. Uh, so the people that owned the salt works needed to, a way of making sure that that was kept to a minimum. So they needed people to keep an eye on what was going on. So. Um, and weaponry was probably advisory uh, in, in some of those dealings. Uh, we've got things like this musket and fantastic shoes, which I'm wearing. I don't know if you can see my shoes, but they are they are wonderful. This is our replica salt pan up at Brora. Um, as much as you'd have saw on a salt pan back in the day, a lot smaller scale though. So we load our furnace with, with wood, and we also have some Brora coal here, which we're using to to supplement that as well. Um, so what we'll do is we'll light the fire underneath, we'll get the salt water up to a boil, and that's us beginning the process. So we'll fill the pan on top with 50 litres of seawater. That water's straight out of the sea, it's not been treated in any way. Yeah, uh, my name's Colin Dent. Uh, the boat that we have used for your collection was uh, called the Robert Brown. I was a bit, uh, bit baffled as to why, you, you know, they wanted seawater so far out and then they explained to me what they were doing I went oh right okay and I knew about the salt panning anyway you know it was quite interesting I was all for it yeah I was absolutely delighted to help you've got a place called Ardassi which is a, like a rocky point that comes out I knew that the the quality of the water was better there than anywhere else that I know you know and it, as you've seen yourself it's it's clean and uh, it was an honour to collect your water for you, you know, for your project here today. So we'll have things like bits of seaweed, little bits of shell, little bits of sand in there that we want to remove. And what we do to clean it up is we break two egg whites into it whilst that water's still cool, before it's reached boiling point. And as this egg white congeals together as the water warms up, it'll gather together all these little particles of sand, little bits of seaweed, and they'll be bound together, and that'll form a scum. We can then skim that off and we're left with nice clear water underneath. We'll then top up the pan maybe two or three more times with, with more water just to get the salinity of the water up. Um, sea water's very weak actually, there's not a lot of salt content in it. So we'll keep continually topping this up just to build the salt, salt content up. Some of the different types of boil we get are all based on the sounds that it makes. A rolling boil is what you get early on in the process and the water's really bubbling away, really violently bubbling. Um, but you find as the water becomes more dense, and more saturated with salt, it becomes more of a seething boil. A seething boil is where you look at the surface of the water and it's just bubbling away and it gives that real seething sound coming off. Um, we also have what we would call a sizzling boil. So on the very last boil that we do, 
and we're very saturated with salt, a very slow heat underneath. You'll just hear this very fine sizzling hissing sound. And that's when we know we're really at the point of, of getting salt off quite soon. And on the very last boiling we'll put four shallow trays into the corner of the pan and what these trays do is they catch all the scratch. Naturally within seawater you get a lot of elements like calcium, eh, magnesium, potassium and if you left these within your salt it would give it a, a very bitter taste. So these trays in the corners where it's less turbulent a little cooler will capture these elements as they drop out of suspension within the seawater. And you'll notice that as a, a yellow powder that forms so it's quite different from the, the flaky salt white crystals. And we'll then carefully lift those trays out we'll get rid of that salt scratch. So then what we're left with is salt crystals that start to form on the surface of the water. We'll then simmer it very slowly. The slower we can do this, the better, as we'll get bigger crystals. And as these get bigger and bigger, we'll start raking them into the middle. We'll then place all those crystals into a basket. So what we do is we line this basket with a muslin rag. We'll hang it up to dry. Then over the course of a week, that'll dry out. And at the end of that, we'll be left with nice, dry, flaky white salt. very salty. It's been a really wonderful and momentous day. So we've brought salt making back to Barora. I mean, it, the process has taken all day. And when it first started, it was just like water. And then as the day went on, it got lower and lower. And the crystals started forming on the top of the water. And it was just fantastic to see it. Unbelievable, really. Well, you know, everything seems to have come together today. So this is a, a wicker salt basket, and it was made by uh, archaeologist Cathy Dagg on the same lines as uh, diagrams in uh, William Brownrigg's um, Art of Salt Making. So this is what they use to uh, store the freshly made salt so that it would kind of drip dry. And this basket is actually full of Barora salt. So don't drop it. <laughs> yeah, we started off as complete and utter novices and we've ended the day with our stash of salt mm -hmm. and I think you can probably call us apprentice salters now. <laughs> <laughs>